Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the Ring of Fire, as, as Attila mentioned, uh, we like to refer to it as Canada's next base metal mining camp. This is, I think people in Sudbury have a real appreciation for camp scale, especially base metal mining. You know, we, uh, you know, Ontario, um, it's really, when it comes to base metal camps, it's Sudbury. So um, um, we hope to be the next one on the list here. Um, standard cautionary note, just I'll be obviously doing a little bit of arm waving here and there um uh, take it with a grain of salt but uh, hopefully what i say is is um, as exciting for you as as it is for me so a little bit about uh, noron for those who don't know us um we're a, a mineral exploration development company working in ring of fire which is located 500 kilometers north of thunder bay our vision is to develop the eagle's nest nickel copper pg mine and follow that up with development of the Blackbird Chromite mine. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for infrastructure to make its way north, we continue to explore the region with the objective of adding additional nickel copper PG resources, uh, as well as copper zinc resources to the inventory of projects. Uh, we're very much committed to working closely with our First Nation partners in a meaningful way and, and to implement our field programs with a focus on health, safety, and the environment. A uh, little bit of an update in December of last year, um, Wailu Metals, which is a, a large uh, private equity fund in Australia, um, purchased uh, the, the existing share base from, uh, of Noron resources from resource capital funds, our previous largest shareholder. So we now have a new strategic investor, which is Wailu. I'm very happy about that. Um, the, a lot of things align between Wailu and Noron, um, you know, specifically their focus on um, things like battery metals and, and, and the, the resources we're going to need to decarbonize the planet. So on the uh, right hand side, I've just taken a snapshot from the World Bank Group's mineral, Minerals for Climate Action. You can see chromium, copper and nickel are, are listed as required metals for a lot of the, uh, you know, energy, energy, um, metals needed for the future so you know we know the ring of fires is very rich in chromium and nickel as well as copper so there's an exciting time uh, upon us for those those of us in the nickel space uh, we see it in in the price of nickel um, we see it in the valuations of nickel and juniors and and, and majors so uh, i think it's a great time for wailu to come on board and we welcome them okay i'm going to go a little bit through the just quickly through the uh, discovery timeline, the Ring of Fire. It really started in 2002 with the discovery of the McFolds one and three copper zinc uh, uh, sulfide lenses over here in sort of the Eastern section of the Ring of Fire by De Beers and KWG, uh, looking for diamonds in fact. And so that spurred the initial staking rush. Uh, a lot of juniors entered the area and were exploring for, for copper zinc VMS deposits. And in 2007, Eagle's Nest was discovered. Um, we all know Eagle's Nest is a high grade nickel copper PG deposit. And so that really got the, the wheels moving on the staking brush in the ring of fire um, when, when the intersection started coming out of Eagle's Nest. And such that, you know, with, with staking and with exploration, numerous other uh, discoveries were made. Most importantly, the chromite discoveries in 2008, Blackbird, Black Thor, Big Daddy, um, and a number of other um, significant occurrences. Eagle 2, another nickel copper PG occurrence, Blue Jay, um, the, uh, the 501 VMS deposits in the north. And by 2013, you know, we had the major metal downturn in 2012. So made it hard for juniors to raise money and a lot of them left the ring of fire. It's a challenging area to explore, expensive, and they just you know, decided they would check uh, into other areas, but it provided an opportunity for Noron to really double down in the ring of fire and expand our land position such that by uh, 2015 with the acquisition of Cliffs properties and in 2016 with the acquisition of McDonald Mines properties and then in 2017 when we staked a large land uh, package for gold, we really became the dominant landholder and, and um, you know, holding what I believe to be the best ground in the ring of fire. Um, this is the land 
status as it is today, you can see that there's been more companies have entered back into the ring of fire, which is a great thing. We're, we're happy to see that. Um, we think uh, the region is, is ripe for further exploration and discovery. We have a little bit of an overview of the geology. So uh, this is a, a map that was put together by the OGS and the GSC, um, work that they had, have done since 2010. So the Ring of Fire, it's uh, meso to neo archean greenstone belt, about 200 kilometers from tip to toe. It's not quite a ring, it's more like a backwards sea. Um, and it has a, an unusual abundance of ferrogabroic rocks, as well as ultramafic rocks. And this is really what gives it the magnetic ring, if you will. Um, within the Ring of Fire, there's sort of six main assemblages. Uh, the Mukatai assemblage is, is what I'm going to focus on here because uh, it's dated at 2735. I should back up a minute here that you know, the various assemblages range in age from, from 2828 um, in the Butler assemblage over here all the way to 2702 in the Tappan assemblage. But the, the, the majority of the mineral occurrences and deposits lie within the Mukatai assemblage and, and the age dates there are 20 very close to 2735 within a, year, a million years or two. Um, all of the chromite deposits are situated in here. Most of the nickel, most of the significant nickel copper PG deposits and most of the v, significant VMS deposits are situated in here. So we're gonna look at the geology of the Mukatai assemblage and, and the mineralization within it. Um, and you'll see on this left hand side is a, a sort of a stratigraphic column that we put together. Uh, and it's composite based on a couple of section lines here, A, B, C, D. Uh, just for reference, Eagle's Nest sits down here, Blackbird Chromite sits in here, and then the Black Thor Chromite deposit sits in here. This is a footwall tonalite body, which is right here, dated 2773. Um, and then you have the Mukatai age intrusions, 2734, 2734, and the volcanic sequence all at 2734. So that Mukatai assemblage is about 110 kilometers in strike length, anywhere from one to 15 kilometers in map thickness. True thickness is unknown at this point. It's still sort of early days. We don't have exposure, so it's all based on drill core. Uh, but age dating of intrusive and volcanic sequences really, as I say, returns a tight cluster at 2735, um, and it's host to approximately half of the known mineral occurrences. What's really neat about this particular belt of rocks is that, you know, you have nickel copper PG mineralization right at the very basal tip of the, and, and I should point out that stratigraphic um, facings to the southeast in this part of the belt but that you have nickel copper mineralization right at the base, stratigraphically above that, you have chromite, and then you keep going up stratigraphy until you end up at the top with these VMS deposits that are all the same age. So this is what got folks like Jim Franklin thinking, you know, that the heat engine for the VMS could have been the intrusion of some of these ferrogabros and or ultramafic bodies. Maybe, maybe not, but it is, uh, it's, it, it's an interesting part of the world to work in, that's for sure. So at the top of the Mukatai, we have the supercrustal sequence, which is dominated by calc alkaline felsic intermediate volcanic clastics and, and flows. Very minor mafic component to the volcanics. Um, and, and most of the sediments are, are volcanic clastic sediments. This hosts the VMS mineralization. Further down stratigraphy, you have um, a number of intrusive suites, the lowest being the basal ultramafic sills and dikes with comatiatic affinity. This hosts the copper, nickel, uh, PGE, and chrome mineralization. Above that are the ferrogabro sills with enriched morph signatures, and these hosts a lot of ferro, or rather iron, titanium, vanadium, and phosphorus occurrences. And then sort of sandwiched in there uh, between the two are the synvolcanic felsic intrusive sills, which typically lie below the main volcanic sequence. Uh, back to the geology, just to give you a feel for where the mineral occurrences lie. So uh, the Butler VMS field is over here on the, on the, on the southwest. Um, McFold's VMS field is over here on the uh, east. And the 501 VMS field is here on the north. 
Um, down in the southeast is where the nickel, copper, PGE, and chromite field is, where the, the bulk of the ultramafic uh, intrusives lie, including Eagle's Nest. But we also have some interesting gold mineralization occurring in the, in the structures that pass through here. And then just to the northeast is uh, the Thunderbird uh, intrusion, which hosts the titanium vanadium mineralization. So I'm gonna zoom in now into this southeastern part of the Ring of Fire, because that's really the area that's that's been the focus of exploration for us um, for the last uh, at least five years. This is a map uh, taken from work by Michelle Houlet, Mike Lesher, uh, Matsuranta and Sapin, released in 2019. Um, just to make sure everybody's aware, north is down and to the left. So we've, we've taken this and sort of rotated the geology to give you a feel for how these intrusions were initially uh, emplaced in, in, into the, uh, the host rocks here. So really there's the two ultramafic silk complexes here, the Black Thor ultramafic silk complex on the left and the double eagle intrusive complex on the right. Um, Black Thor has been dated at 2734. We don't have a date yet for the black of the double eagle intrusion, but the chemistry and the geology stratigraphy are all virtually identical. So uh, we're running with the theory that they're the same age. Um, so the sills occur at the contact between a regional tonalite body, which is this tan colored unit, uh, and that's dated at 2773, and an overlying supercrustal sequence, the Victory Assemblage, which is dated at 2780. So about a 40 million year difference between uh, when these ultramafic sills were intruded um, and you know, the previous intrusive episode, which was this tonalite body. And it's very interesting and probably not surprising that you have these ultramafics that are coming up through the crust. And then when they reach a point of, of neutral buoyancy at that contact between the, this tonalite body and, and the overlying volcanics, that's when they started to sill outwards. Um, based on the abundance of olivine and chromite within the ultramafic complexes coupled with their form, the sills are interpreted to be <clears throat> flow through systems. So we're, we're not seeing the full extent, we don't think, of, of, of the, um, the magma. Um, and we certainly see footwall feeder dikes uh, beneath the intrusions and Eagle's Nest is probably the best example. Um, it's the it's it's interpreted to be a feeder dike to the double sill double eagle sill over here. Another thing worth pointing out is you can see how much more well preserved the Black Thor intrusion is relative to double eagle. Double eagle's been sort of uh, faulted and sheared up, um, but we, we've been able to reconstruct a lot of the geology in here, and it's remarkable how similar the two are stratigraphically. This is just sort of an idealized cartoon of what one of these sill, sills look like uh, in the Ring of Fire. It's dominated by this purple unit, which is sort of dunites and peridotites. Um, chromite mineralization will sort of occur scattered throughout here, but is most concentrated towards the top of the peridotite sequence. Above that, the, the olivine really disappears and you're into peroxinites and leucogabros in the hanging wall sequence. Um, you get embayments and trough features towards the base of the sill and that's uh, we see nickel sulfide mineralization occurring in there at uh, eagle two and at uh, the blue jay occurrence um, and as well of course in these footwall uh, um, conduits that such as eagle's nest which were are interpreted to be feeders to these overlying sills so we're going to look at the, uh, the, the sort of the most basal mineralization in the in the muck time will work our way up. Um, so here we've got magmatic nickel copper PGEs, um, Eagle's Nest being the best example, but also we see it at Blue Jay and Eagle Two. Uh, mineralization here occurs at the stratigraphic base of their host ultramafic intrusions within feeder conduit skills. Very high tenor sulfides, uh, massive sulfide from Eagle's Nest typically runs anywhere from 6 to 10% nickel, 4 to 6% copper, 10 to 15 grams per ton palladium, and, and 3 to 7 grams per ton platinum. So very high tenor, high byproduct rich material. 
A little bit about the discovery of Eagle's Nest. It was initially identified in 2004 as a geotam anomaly, uh, but it was assumed to be VMS related and not drilled until 2007. Uh, and it's funny because the land package actually changed hands a few times in between. Uh, but that first hole into Eagle's Nest returned over 71 meters of just over a percent nickel, 0.8% uh, copper and three grams per ton PGE as net textured sulfides and pritatite. And that's, that's almost from surface, that mineralization. So very exciting intersection. Um, since then, we've drilled over 63,000 meters in 127 holes. And we've defined a vertically plunging ultramafic um, conduit or feeder dike with the bulk of the mineralization occurring at the base of that, um, of that conduit. Mineralization is dominated by net textured sulfides with basal accumulation of mass of sulfides. And sulfide tenors are quite high. Um, and to date, we've defined the mineralization down to from surface down to a depth of about 1300 meters. It remains open. Um, the strike dimension is not huge, you know, it's about 150 meters in, in, uh, from surface and thickness of 20 to 50 meters. So the airborne response, you know, this is a nice late time conductor, but it wouldn't have been something that was 500 meters long, which I think is probably why it was, it was overlooked early on. But uh, suffice to say, you know, small footprint, but, but very high, uh, good, good, good tenored sulfides and great uh, plunge extent. So worth the search for, for these smaller surface area um, occurrences. In 2011, we released a resource for Eagle's Nest, um, measured indicated of 11 million tons at, at these grades, and then an additional 9 million tons of inferred material at these grades here. I want to walk us through uh, a quick video of um, our current understanding of the geology and, and uh, hopefully uh, it doesn't go too quickly here. Before I start, I'll just point out this is Eagle's Nest here. Uh, the whole area is the double eagle intrusive complex. Um, purples are pritatites, dunites, dominantly pritatite. Um, stratigraphic tops are to the southeast both at Eagle's Nest and, and in, the, in the double eagle intrusive here. The, the main, the blackbird occur, um, chromite deposits are situated in this portion of the double eagle intrusive complex. And that's been offset along the Triple J fault here, uh, about a kilometer, 1.2 kilometers dextrally uh, to the Northeast. Within the blackbird intrusion, uh, there are chromite lenses throughout, but the most dominant one is the BB2-1 chromite lens, which follows this horizon right here. You can see that there's some later brittle faults that offset that. And then you're into this mauve colored peroxinite and hanging wall um, gabbro. So we'll zoom in here as this goes. Uh, there's Eagle's Nest. Um, and you can see that the mineralization is at the base. This is the stratigraphic base of that bladed dike. We'll rotate this now and we're looking sort of down into the mineralization. Um, so you can see at the top of the mineralization is the disseminated material which grades down into net textured and then into massive sulfides. As we rotate uh, we're going to go through the deposit sort of plan by plan and you can see the mineralization hugging that uh, that that northwestern contact that the mass of sulfide is largely towards the base. There were multiple pulses of mineralization or rather of, of magma through this this conduit as would be expected so you know there are areas where it's better defined and, and more poorly defined. Uh, and I'll just pause for a second there that gives you sort of perspective this is the BB2-1 chromite lens um, and that's the Triple J fault. And then this is that, uh, what we call the AT, AT1 and, and East Dyke area. We'll rotate back to orthogonal view. There's for scale the CN Tower. So Eagle's Nest is about two and a half times the height of the CN Tower, just for reference. Um, and then we'll again rotate back to you the satellite imagery. This is Esker Camp, um, our exploration camp. In fact, this is this is Esker Camp right here. 
Um, so the deposit sits about 200 meters uh, west of Esker. And it's worth noting that the, the, the future mine will more or less lie within the footprint of, of what's been cleared already for the site, the camp. So in 2012, we released a feasibility study that showed uh, Eagle's Nest to be an economic uh, uh, project with an 11 year mine life. We believe that uh, we can easily extend that to about 20 years with resource development and converting inferred resources into, into measured indicated at depth. Uh, it'll be a 3000 ton per day underground operation, small footprint. Uh, we plan on utilizing a paste backfill plant to take the, the waste material and put it back underground. You know, one of the things early on when we were um, consulting with the communities is, is their biggest concern was water. How are we going to prevent, um, you know, the surface water with all the water you have in the ring of fire? How do you keep that from, from being contaminated? So we said, well, we can avoid open pits. That's one way for sure. And surface tailings facilities. So we plan to, to, to put that waste back underground and, and in fact that'll allow us to to more effectively uh, mine a lot of those stopes. Uh, given the high byproduct credits we anticipate Eagle's Nest to be a, a very low cost producer um, although we do have some feasibility study updates that we need to do to optimize things um, you know, we just in November put out uh, some news on um, some network that we had had done at uh, XPS looking at uh, creating separate nic nickel copper cons. So that's looking good. Um, we want to pull some things out from the feasibility study, uh, simplify them, uh, move the concentrator on the surface, look at the cobalt resource. You know, in 2012, uh, cobalt pricing was nowhere near what it is today. So, you know, we want to look at that and, and see what sort of uh, value that may add. Beyond Eagle's Nest, though, you know, we, we're firm believers that there are uh, more significant discoveries to be made in, in the Ring of Fire on, on the nickel copper front. So uh, we know that the nickel mineralization is typically high tenor in the Ring of Fire with lots of byproduct credits. So it makes deep targeting worth the effort. Um, we've identified over 70 early stage nickel targets, which we believe warrant further work. So the bulk of the this year, or at least the first half of this year, we really want to focus on reviewing historic geophysical data sets associated with these targets to help identify, uh, you know, quality overlooked EM targets and looking beyond the 200 meter depth range. And you have to remember when a lot of these surveys were flown in 2006, 7, 8, 9, it was a fractured land position, you know, uh, uh, and things were rushed. There was a lot of, you know, test this target, move on, test this target, move on. So, so it's very possible that data wasn't properly analyzed, reviewed, whatnot. And we think that there's potential for some uh, further discoveries at depth with, with our understanding of geology in the region now and our consolidated land position, it allows us to do a lot of things that the, you know, early days NORAC team was unable to. And so, our initial search will focus on the main block area here. Uh, this is where the bulk of our, our data uh, exists. You can see it outlines all the various, in pink, various uh, airborne EM surveys, ZTEM, airborne gravity, uh, plus the bulk of the drilling that's, that's happened in the ring of fires in this area here. So that will be the focus for us. And really what we wanna do is create a whole earth 3D model down to about a kilometer depth and, and that will really guide us with our deeper targeting. Okay, we'll move on now uh, to uh, chromite mineralization. Um, so we're talking really about the Blackbird, Black Horse, Big Daddy, Black Thor, and Black Label deposits. Everything's black when we talk about chromite. Uh, the mineralization, uh, the chromite mineralization, as I mentioned earlier, is situated near the top of these uh, chromatiatic sill complexes as you transition from peridotite to peroxinite. And the mineralization is very typically very thick, tabular lenses, massive to banded, and um, hosted within dunites and peridotites. This is a long section view um, with that. Uh, so Eagle's Nest is in the background here. 
and it's about 500 to 700 meters northeast of the Blackbird chromite deposit, which is why the first chrome deposit we want to mine will be Blackbird. Uh, but about four kilometers to the uh, northeast is uh, the Big Daddy chrome deposit. Um, and just northeast of that is Blackthorn. In fact, these are all, it's all one deposit. There's been some faulting, uh, but uh, this has just been omitted because this isn't Norland's ground, it's, it's probes. Um, I should also mention that the Black Horse deposit is, is located sort of down, down in here. So uh, it's really amazing geologically to think about the volume of chromite that's been uh, crystallized out of these magmas. Here's a summary table of uh, Norant's uh, chromite resources in the Ring of Fire uh, with Blackbird. And Black Thor is really the, the largest uh, of, of the chromite deposits in the Ring of Fire. But collectively, between these four deposits, we, we control over 200 million tons of high grade chromite resources in the Ring of Fire. So, um, um, in this image here, I've sort of flipped the, the geology map just so, so it lines up with this long section. Uh, here's Black. Thor, and there's Big Daddy, and then over here is Black Horse, which would be down here, and then Blackbird over here. So uh, this gives you a feel for, if you think about the amount of material that we would propose to mine, about, uh, you know, just under a million tons of chromite per year, um, and you're sitting on 200 million tons of chromite, you'll be mining for, for quite a while. So uh, there's potential to, to build a new industry in the country here with, with uh, chromite and ferrochrome production. And it will start in the Ring of Fire. So how was Blackbird discovered? Uh, really, it was a bit clandestine. Uh, like a lot of the discoveries in the Ring of Fire, Norant was drilling a, 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 a nickel copper target, a VTEM anomaly that turned out to be the Eagle II nickel copper PG occurrence, and that's located southwest of Eagle's Nest. Um, and in 2008, they drilled through the nickel mineralization and kept going and intersected the Blackbird I chromite lens beneath, structurally beneath Eagle II. So um, the first reported hole there returned 49 meters at 39% CR203, which is massive chromite. Uh, this actually was the second chrome discovery in the Ring of Fire. The first was Big Daddy in 2006, although the first hole in a Big Daddy, I believe, was a couple meters of massive chromite. So I don't think the geologists, excuse me, at the time really knew what, what they were looking at or the significance of it. So it kind of flew under the radar until um, Blackbird and Black Thor discoveries, and then Black, uh, then then uh, the Big Daddy kind of followed. So. Um, since then, we've put about 74,000 meters uh, into the Blackbird deposit, intersecting numerous high-grade chromite lenses within a faulted ultramafic sill complex. This is an internal block model, uh, and, and this is the Blackbird 2-1 lens, which is the highest grade and the most continuous. Um, the, the mineralization sits within uh, an, H, an ultramafic sill that's about 850 meters thick um, and as I mentioned the majority of that mineralization lies within the BB2-1 lens over 50 percent of the resource. Uh, mineralization there runs about 38 percent CR203 about 15 to 20 meters thick true thickness uh, with a strike of over 900 meters and a dip of over 800 meters which remains open. Uh, the resource from Blackbird in 2011 had a measure, measured indicated of 20 million tons at those grades and a, an inferred resource of 23 million tons at these grades. Uh, there currently is not a, a, a uh, feasibility study out for Blackbird. That's something that Norant will be working on uh, well, starting with, with the PEA. That's something we want to accomplish this year just to help you know, the investment community understand the economics behind chromite. So here's a uh, interpreted surface geology map and the stratigraphic column for Blackbird. The intrusion is really divided into three series, a lower series, which aside for the Blackbird one lens right at the base is, is largely devoid of any significant chromite mineralization. Uh, it's pretty tight, dunite with just eutectic chromite, so a couple percent chromite. It's not until the middle series that you start to get significant accumulations of chromite. And really that happens towards the top of the middle series with the BB2-1 lens. 
And you can see that sort of traced out along here. Uh, as we move up into the upper series, we, we move away from olivine and chromite into pyroxene feldspar. Uh, so chromite disappears, but what we actually start to see is the development of some PGE reefs. And so this is something that's of interest to us. We, you know, there's more work that needs to be done there, more, probably more drilling and, and definitely more sampling. Um, but, uh, you know, again, we have this sort of the total package uh, here in terms of uh, mineral commodities. So worth noting that the stratigraphy and chrome compositions are at Blackbird are very similar to Black Thor, suggesting similar parental magmas and igneous processes. So Norant's business plan when it comes to chromite is really to leverage the success of Eagle's Nest and, and the infrastructure at Eagle's Nest, including the camp, the mine, airstrip and, and road to support development of Blackbird as the initial chromite mine in the Ring of Fire. Um, with the development of the mine will come development of a ferrochrome processing facility, which we propose to build in Sault Ste. Marie. And that product will be largely targeted for demand, uh, US stainless steel uh, demand. So we think we can penetrate the US market about, provide about 50% of the of the demand there for the stainless steel sector as you know as uh, blackbird continues uh, and, and our fpf site continues to deliver um, and as ferrochrome pricing uh, allows we would absolutely plan to expand production um, into probably black thor um, and expand the ferrochrome processing facility to penetrate into the european and asian markets uh, but we don't want to start too big, you know, it's, 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 it's no small task building a uh, smelter in Ontario and chromite is, is not a, an exceptionally well known commodity or, or, or uh, um, business unit. So we want to make sure we do it right. We believe we can. Um, and we've partnered with Hatch on that, uh, one of the world's foremost engineering firms when it comes to hot metal plants. Hatch did all of the uh, feasibility work for cliffs on their ferrochrome processing facility. So of which we have that data when, which we acquired when we uh, bought Cliff's the Black Thor project. So, you know, we've got a lot of things going for us on the chromite side and um, we think the future is, is, is quite rosy there. Okay, I'll move on now to VMS mineralization within the Mukatai. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it's that's, higher up within the volcanic packages, uh, sort of above the, the ultramafic and ferrogobroic intrusions. Um, and that includes the McFolds, the Butler and the 501 occurrences in the ring of fire. Um, mineralization is hosted by felsic to intermediate volcanic clastic rocks, uh, certainly at McFolds. And then at uh, uh, the 501, we, there's magnetite talc chlorite alteration associated with some of these lenses. And it gives you a real distinct magnetic targets coupled with the, e, the EM signature. Um, so they kind of stand out, uh, but not all the VMS mineralization, as we know, has that alteration patterns. That's something we've learned actually with uh, the discovery of the McFolds 8 lens. Um, worth noting that there are zinc rich camps such as Butler and 501, and then copper rich camps such as at McFolds and, you know, I don't know if Harold Gibson is on this call, but uh, uh, Harold, your VMS FASI's lessons are coming in uh, big time here because it certainly helped us, you know, when it comes to reconstructing the stratigraphy in the McFolds camp and understanding these lenses is, is, is improved targeting drastically. So uh, a bit of a discovery history here. So as I mentioned, these were the first uh, McFolds, the first, um, Deposits discovered in 2002 um, in a joint venture between Spider, KWG, and De Beers looking for diamonds. Um, that was the McFolds number one and number three lenses. Lots of work happened between then and, and about 2011. And then it kind of went quiet as, as the focus shifted from exploration towards development um, in the chromite space and, and at Eagle's Nest. We acquired the property from Cliffs in 2015 and we began our compilation and targeting work. Uh, we did an initial drill program there in 2017 
and discovered the number eight lens on that first program, which was a real success. Um, and that was on the back of borehole EM surveying of a historic hole. So this is the number three lens here. This is the block model, copper grades are down in here. Um, and there was a hole that went underneath the number three lens um, that had not gone surveyed. We went in and surveyed it and, and it picked up the number eight foot wall or uh, the number eight lens. What's interesting about that is stratigraphically, the number eight lens sits about 175 meters into the foot wall of number three. And it's almost invisible from surface because of the large EM response in, uh, from number three. So we know that we can't only just rely on airborne geophysics for, for targeting in the, re in the region. Not all of these sulfide deposits are going to daylight. Some are going to start 300, two, three, 400 meters down. And number eight is a great example of that. So uh, the initial drill hole into it returned nine meters of 2% copper, 3.6 zinc, and a, and, a, and a little bit of silver. We've since drilled another 18 holes into, the, into that deposit, plus some of the surrounding anomalies and discovered three different BMS horizons, number eight, nine, and 10. Um, one of the highlights from number eight was 26 and a half meters at 2% copper, 3.4 zinc. Uh, early days, I, I believe, still in this belt. Um, we know to date the most significant lenses are number one, three, and eight. And we were able to, we, we can sort of combine these and, and rename them the Nika deposit and put out a 43-101 on that uh, just last year. It's got a global resource of, of just shy of 5 million tons at, at between two and 3% uh, copper equivalent. So we, we've got some work to go there. Our, our, our target in, at the McFolds Basin is about 10 million tons of, of two to 3% copper equivalent. Um, but I think there's, uh, there's potential yet. So uh, here's the surface geology, interpreted surface geology. Uh, and, and really what we have are, we believe four VMS horizons, the Tamarack horizon here, which sort of wraps around uh, the Nika horizon here, which hosts the number one, number nine, number 10, number eight, and number three uh, sulfide occurrences and lenses. The number two horizon over here, and then the number four. Um, stratigraphic facing is to the northwest and everything is dipping steeply to the northwest here. So when we look at um, sort of a cartoon reconstruction, what we think we've got is a series of stacked lenses, number three, number eight here, uh, and number four, and potentially um, some more down here, um, sort of along possible synvolcanic structures within a half graben. Um, we believe that there's additional, uh, well, we know that there's additional targets. We think there's, there's great prospectivity yet, especially along that Nika horizon. Um, so this is the number three deposit, uh, or lens rather number, number eight lens, which has a copper zinc rich portion and a copper foot wall, uh, rich portion and the number one lens and, and situated along that horizon, we've got a significant gravity anomaly here, which is remains untested. The closest hole we have to that uh, intersected about 22 meters of, of almost 2% zinc and stratigraphically above number eight and uh, with very intense alteration. Some of the most intense alteration actually we see in this space. And so this area definitely needs some holes drilled into it. And um, hopefully we'll be able to do that in the not too distant future. Okay, we're going to move on to gold now. This has been um, something I've been excited about for a while on the Ring of Fire. Um, so here's a mag image of the region. And the Ring of Fire really has lots of attributes that are favorable for big gold deposits. I mean, you've got l large regional structures. This is the South Kenyan Fault Zone in the north, the Webakwe Shear Zone in the south. You have an abundance of iron rich reactive host rocks um, in these ferrogabro sills, all outlined in white in here. Um, you have uh, the presence of younger sedimentary basins flanking these, these older supercustal rocks, a la Tamiskaming type sediments. 
and you've got lots of evidence for multiple folding and shearing events. So uh, the challenge, of course, is exploring in an area that's covered by muskeg, where you can't, you know, you can't, uh, excuse me, use a lot of the typical prospecting tools that you would say in the Abitibi. Um, so, <clears throat> but what's interesting is where we have had some drilling proximal to some of these structures while drilling for base metals, such as at the Triple J Gold Zone, we hit gold mineralization. Um, and so uh, it, to me, it's no surprise. This is, uh, these little crosses are, are drill holes and then the stars are known gold occurrences. But there's not a lot of drilling in the area of these structures, really. They're all south of the structures targeting EM conductors. And so um, we want to do some, some more work up there. This is, you know, our, our land position and uh, really highlights, I think, what we've done to try and secure the best ground up there. Uh, the Triple J gold zone, here are, uh, you know, some highlights. Uh, of, of some of the mineralization. It's, it's situated within um, talc carbonate altered ultramafix. Um, in fact, it shares the same stratigraphic uh, setting as the Blackbird chromite, Blackbird one chromite lens and the Eagle two nickel sulfide lens. So that also is interesting, the juxtaposition of those of three mineral occurrences. Um, here's some VG in, in a quartz vein in the triple J gold zone. So. Early days, but um, and when we staked those claims in 2017, really what we were hoping to do was bring in a major or a mid-tier gold miner that that's got the sort of experience, the technical expertise, and the financial backing to help us advance some of these early stage targets. Uh, we've yet to do that. So this past summer, we said, well, let's see what we can do on our own. And uh, we had done soil sampling in the Ring of Fire previously for base metals. Um, and in the process, came up with some interesting gold anomalies. So we thought, well, let's try, let's try using soils for gold. Um, you know, it's, it's not impossible. Uh, it's a challenging area to work, but not impossible. So we focused on two areas, the Webaquay shear zone and the Thunderbird grid up in here. And uh, we were quite pleased with the results. So. <clears throat> this is the, the uh, soil grid over the Webaquay shear zone. The Triple J gold zone sits up here and the Triple J south gold zone sits here. Uh, this is the gold response ratio. Anything that's red, it's 98th percentile response, uh, orange 95th and yellow 90th. So you can see there's a real cluster of anomalous soils associated with this Triple J and Triple J south uh, uh, occurrences. We also have some interesting uh, anomalies associated with some splay zones off of the main Webaquay shear here. Um, and when you kind of step back and look at this whole area, uh, you know, we think we might be looking at something like a duplex structure. It, 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 it's a challenging area to work, not just because of, you know, the lack of outcrop, but, you know, when you're interpreting structures from MAG, you, you can come up with some great 2D interpretations, but getting that third dimension is, is challenging. And uh, so, you, you know, drilling helps obviously, but uh, most of the drilling, as I mentioned before, is targeting base metal mineralization. So you don't always get that, that third layer. Um, over at the Thunderbird uh, uh, soil grid. So this is the layered ferrogabro body known as a Thunderbird intrusion. Uh, Norant had been, has done some drilling in this part of the world uh, back in 2009 for base metals, looking at, at, um, at some EM conductors. And this is where we intersected lots of great titanium, uh, vanadium mineralization within uh, magnetite to ilmenite layers of, of the ferrocabros. Interestingly, about uh, one of these holes returned, you know, just over six grams gold, you know, over about 40 centimeters which in itself is not terribly exciting, but when you look at that, the core for that mineralized zone, what you see are, are thin little quartz sulfide veinlets coming through and permeating into the ferrogabro and sulfidizing the magnetite and dropping out the gold, much like you would have in a banded iron formation hosted deposit. That intersection there is about a kilometer away from this big mag break in this ferrogabro body. So, 
we, I've always been interested in that. Um, so we, we didn't have a lot of budget or time at this point. So we did two lines across it. And I think the results speak for themselves. That line that parallels the structure, highly anomalous, lots of highly anomalous samples versus the cross line, not so much. So uh, the soil program was, I think, a, a, a great success for us. First of all, showed us that soil sampling works as a first pass screening tool. And this is a bit of a breakthrough because it will allow us to do a lot more screening, early screening at a fraction of the cost. And um, also has identified Thunderbird fault as, as a significant uh, anomaly, which warrants further work. So we wanna do some more soil sampling this summer, um, both along the Webaquay shear zone and within other structures in the Ring of Fire. Uh, this is just an image of one of our field workers, Scott. <laughs> This is not a, a normal auger hole. This is one of the deeper holes we had to, 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 to get down through the muskeg, but typically the hole, the, the muskeg is about two meters thick. Um, and this is the material we're after. It's a light gray, real sticky clay. And uh, that's the material we take and, and, and sample. Lastly, I'll just touch on the iron, titanium, vanadium, phosphorus mineralization in the Mukatai. Uh, so really, we're talking about the Thunderbird intrusion, uh, the Sanderson and Butler East, which isn't shown in this mag image. Here we have magnetite, ilmenite, cumulate layers uh, within these ferro-gabro sills. Um, interesting, absolutely interesting for the, the iron, titanium, vanadium potential. I think down the road, once we get the, the, the nickel and chromite mines going, this these, these occurrences may see a lot more attention for that. Uh, right now, if, you know, the interest I have for them is, is the gold uh, potential, uh, specifically for iron replacement style gold mineralization. Okay, I'm gonna hit pause on the geology. Talk a little bit about the road because obviously everybody is interested in uh, where we're at there. So. Currently, there's four road segments that are being studied, which would collectively form a north-south all-season access road to the Ring of Fire. Um, the, the roads would start from Nikina. There's an existing forestry road now that's being looked at, uh, which would need to be upgraded. Um, from Painter Lake, right about here, Martin Falls First Nation is the proponent for a north-south all-season community access road, which will follow that high ground that was laid, uh, there's an esker that sort of runs north-south. Um, as well, Webaquay First Nation up here is the proponent for uh, a, a, a supply road to the Ring of Fire from their community. And then just last year, Webaquay and Martin Falls announced a co-proponency for the Northern Road Link. And that's really the last piece of the puzzle here. So all uh, four of those road segments are currently undergoing environmental assessments. Norant is supporting these studies with data that we've gathered um, both in our own studies and through the acquisition of CLIFS data. Um, we anticipate that these road EAs will be completed by 2023, followed by permitting and construction in 2025. So uh, these timelines actually dovetail nicely with the completion of our feasibility study updates for Eagle's Nest, <clears throat> coupled with the uh, detailed engineering EA and permitting and construction for, for Eagle's Nest. And this is a bit of a busy slide, but just gives you an idea of the project timelines for the roads, Eagle's Nest, and, and eventually um, Blackbird uh, Mine. So um, ideally, this is what we're trying to target here at some point in 2025, the completion of the roads and the completion of uh, the mine build. So that when that road gets there, we're ready to ship out the first concentrate. So in summary, uh, the Ring of Fire has an unusually high mineral endowment. Um, you know, in 15 years of exploration, eight deposits have been discovered with calculated resources and or reserves and over a mil 100 uh, mineral occurrences. This despite the logistical challenges and the high cost of exploring up there. And while development has proceeded slower than hoped, recent advances on the North-South Access Road are, are, are promising especially with First Nation-led proponency. This is something that's fairly new and, and actually quite exciting. <clears throat> the, 
Based on our evolved understanding of the geology in the Ring of Fire, we view the potential for additional base metal discoveries to be quite high, especially in, in the depths below those traditional airborne surveys. Um, so with that, we're going to continue to explore for nickel copper PGEs and copper zinc. Um, and as I mentioned, gold, we think that the, the, the region has high prospectivity for, for gold discoveries. There's lots of greenfield targets, and so we want to advance that as well. We've consolidated our land, the land position in the Ring of Fire. We think we've got the most prospective ground for both base and precious metals, and, and that really positions Noron for continued exploration to success well into the future. Our lead development project, Eagle's Nest, has the potential to supply the rapidly growing demand for uh, metals needed to decarbonize the planet. And Wailu's recent cornerstone investment in Noron, I think, is a, is a real testament to this. And finally, once established, our Chrome business plan will create a new industry in Canada, uh, producing low cost green ferrochrome uh, for over a century of demand. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time and open it up to questions. Yeah, thanks Ryan, that was, that was awesome. It's amazing how much potential there is in, the, in this belt. Um, yeah, we already we're already getting some questions uh, coming in, and I have a I have a few uh, some geological, some more on the exploration and development strategy. So, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the endowment a couple times, and so how unique is it? You think uh, the endowment of the of the Ring of Fire Greenstone Belt? So is it is it kind of unique in terms of of other greenstone belts if you compare it? Uh, well, if you look at the Superior Province, first of all. When it comes to chromite, not just in the superior, but there's really no nothing in the superior or even in Canada that compares. It's it on the chromite. These are world class deposits. Um, I mean, Bushville will always eclipse any chrome deposit camp when it comes to size. But what we have over the Bushveld is um, thickness, the thicknesses of the lenses and and the grades. I think uh, uh, beat the Bushveld. But when it comes to nickel copper, I mean, you know, obviously Sudbury is, is number one. Uh, but when we when you look at the Archean, there's not a lot of big Archean uh, nickel deposits in in the Superior. Um, a little different in Western Australia. But so I think the focus is shifting, Attila, from, you know, the, the old view of uh, Gabbro hosted nickel, to large Gabbro complexes and whatnot to these smaller footprint conduit hosted type nickel deposits. And um, they're harder to find, but uh, they tend to be quite high value ores, you know? And, yeah. and so if you can find a field of them, um, you know, you're, you're, you're off to the races. So we're hoping that Eagle's Nest is the first in, in many um, to be found up there. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of weird. The uh, and Josh have this has, has this good question here that um, now this isn't really located around uh, the circum superior belt, right? So usually you get you get these kind of uh, chromatiite hosted nickel copper PGEs and all that, uh, you know, along the edges of the uh, margins of the um, cratons, and and this is sort of in in, in the middle of it, right? Or that's right. Yeah, this would have been a, a you know on the edge of a proto craton. So is there no, any idea why this is located where it is? Is it like a failed rift or I, I don't know? Like well, it's, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not the expert on, on Archean uh, tectonics, but things behave differently back then, you know, like there was, there was uh, much thinner crust. Uh, you didn't have these large amalgamated cratons like you had in the, in the uh, you know, into the Proterozoic and whatnot. So um, yes, I do think it was rifting that, took place. I mean, how else do you get that volume of ultramafic magma to surface? Um, why it is where it is, it's still a question mark. Uh, so. Yeah, that's kind of a segue to uh, Lyle Harris, who is also here today. Mm -hmm. uh, he, in the chat and also on the LinkedIn page, he he's uh, he posted a YouTube video of his, his research with some, uh, some pretty new ideas of how the Ring of Fire formed or sort of uh, Exactly about this Archean tectonics that it's uh, it's a bit different than than how we envision now. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I I watched Lyle's presentation and uh, very interesting. So actually, I have a follow up call scheduled with him. Um, yeah. 
it's harder, you know, in the Archean, it's harder to pinpoint because because the geology was a little bit different back then, right? And and then you have the overprinting, metamorphic, and and, and deformational events. And uh, but but when when you look at where those ultramafic Com so complexes lie at the contact between the tonalite and the overlying uh, volcanic rocks. And when you see the preserved footwall feeder dikes and keels, uh, I think it's a great example of Archean conduit systems. And um, um, so, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe this is a class of deposit that's been sort of overlooked in the past or harder to find and less well-preserved, who knows. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Um, now, in terms of uh, kind of talking a little bit about the exploration strategy, so how did you just give us a bit of an idea of, obviously, it's a, you know, it's remote location and, and not everybody's used to working in these areas. So just can you paint us a picture of, of you know, what are some of the challenges that you're dealing with? How do, how do you have to adjust your exploration strategy? And for where you're operating and, and you know, what exactly is, is the road going to mean to you? So uh, uh, I think- well, I'll yeah, start with that last part first. The road <laughs> is everything. The road is everything. Without the road, there's no ring of fire development, there's, which means there's no exploration. So the road has to happen. These are base metal deposits and they will be base metal mines um, and uh, they'll exist for a long time. So the roads are moving forward, which is, is great. And uh, I know sometimes it's, a, not sometimes, it's most times it's viewed a lot as happening slower than we'd like, but it's happening. When it comes to what we do, uh, in, in, you know, to operate in the ring of fire, I mean, in the winter time, so this, this last image, that's a, a shot from Coper Lake, where we, uh, you know where we, we we make a nice trip you can see in the background there fuel hall you know that's you need diesel fuel to, to run generators and heaters and bring in your jet fuel for your helicopter we we do a ton of helicopter work um in the in the summertime that's the only way to get around and um so it's expensive but you know when you're every every drill move requires 10 hours of helicopter time, um, you know, every shift change requires half an hour or whatnot, uh, which is part of the challenge of, of, of exploring up there. The road will make exploration easier in a lot of regards because you'll be able to bring in supplies by the road. I mean, we'll still be using helicopters and uh, you'll, your crew rotations will happen by fixed wing at, at an airstrip, but um, you know, you won't be, you won't be landing fuel, for example, on using float planes and whatnot. I mean, maybe to some of these more remote camps, but at the mine, I suspect there will be um, a bit of a hub for for satellite exploration, if you will. Yes. Yeah, so right now, how much are you relying on on winter roads, or how, how good have they actually been in recent years? Because I, I mean, from my experience, uh, in the last few years definitely uh, there hasn't been much freeze up and it's getting shorter and shorter the season when you can uh, reliably use winter roads. Yeah, so there is no winter road to the Ring of Fire. Even okay, in the not, winter at time, okay. not at all, wow. still flying. I mean, there are to some of the communities, Martin Falls and, and Webequay, but as you say, those winter roads are getting more and more precarious, which quite frankly is another reason to, and, and the communities say this louder than anybody is, is that they need, all season roads because they know that these winter roads are, are with climate change they're not going to be as reliable as they were the cost of living is ex enormous um roads will alleviate a lot of that so it, it's it's you know it's a win-win-win in my view and in the sense that uh developing the ring of fire also develops the regional infrastructure for a lot of these remote communities and, uh, and and generates jobs and tax revenue for the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A few more questions here on the on the roads. Um, you know, one is is uh, what's going on with 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 an east west road uh, idea, and then the other uh, question is, um, you know, I guess one of the fears of um, developing the area up there and, and and putting a road in there is that suddenly there's going to be roads all over the place through the whole whole area. And, you know, that probably is, is, is one of the uh, 
Yeah. Concerns, yeah. Legitimate concerns, concerns. Yeah, concerns of the com communities, obviously. So yeah. with the terrain that's there, uh, sort of the wetlands and everything, is, is that even a, a, no. a practical, <laughs> it, you know, is it a realistic scenario or is it? No, just, it's not, it's not like working in, in, you know, I'm in Thunder Bay. I've worked on projects where if you want to put a drill trail in, you just go with the bulldozer and, and you know, once you get your permits, away you go. Uh, not so easy in the ring of fire. So to, to put in a road is a major engineering feat. It's, I, I yeah. don't foresee there being roads everywhere. That's, that's not going to happen because of the, the fragility of the ecosystem, but also because it's in engineering, it's not, it's not easy. So the roads that go in, you mentioned the East West road. So Webaquay are, are, uh, moving forward an East West road from their community to the ring of fire and that's the Webaquay supply road and they effectively they want to be uh they want to partake in in the benefits of developing the ring of fire you know they have an airstrip a very uh, a well established long air uh, runway that could be used to bring in certain supplies and and to support the exploration industry um and then uh, but beyond Webaquay <clears throat> I think we saw the east west road uh sort of die off in in 2017 and shift towards the north south road um and it really comes down to the support of the first nation communities mm -hmm. so that that's where things seem to be moving i mean north has always said we'll use whatever road is built east west north south we don't care yeah. as long as there's a road um so but right now it looks like the north south road is 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 the winner and uh you know it, it it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but to answer, you know, that, that your question there around roads all over the Ring of Fire, I don't see that. That the federal government right now is initiating a regional assessment for the area to really try and hammer out the cumulative impact of, of multiple mines, exploration activities, roads, whatnot. And I think a lot of the fears will be dispelled with the with with the with that study you know or just to say look um exploration is still probably largely going to happen using helicopters um and and in the winter time snowmobiles but um um the the advantage of having a road to the ring of fire is you can have a, a hub camp or whatever it is the airstrip that you can have have fuel trucks drive to as opposed to having to fly that fuel in. Now the cost to get that fuel from that hub camp to your remote site is gonna be half or less. So um, now in terms of commodities, so you know, in recent years you've been diversifying a little bit. And, and uh, so how much is that in, in response to you know, market conditions, metal prices, or how much is it sort of a more of a natural evolution of, of I guess, uh, more maturing of the exploration in the belt because you're starting to focus more on gold, which is more difficult to explore yeah. for. Yeah, um, uh, it's a good question. I mean, when I first came on board, uh, our focus was still very much on nickel. Uh, but at the same time, we had, we had acquired the Cliffs assets, including the McFolds properties. And um, so that was, <clears throat> we looked at that data from the, the McFolds uh, drilling and exploration work that had been done and we, we saw some low-hanging fruit so it's a little bit sort of opportunistic you know where can you with a limited exploration budget where can you get your sort of maximum um, impact and 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 we decided in 2017 to shift focus a little bit towards the copper zinc space because we we saw some targets that looked quite compelling and that paid off for us with the discovery of the Nika deposit you know, with a small team, small budgets, you really can't, you can't spread yourself too thin. So we said, well, let's, let's stay focused on the copper zinc. But at the same time, our geological understanding of the ring of fire was improving. We were, we had consolidated the belt and said, okay, well, let's also start thinking about the gold because uh, Al Coots, our, our, our CEO is a geologist. And my boss, Steve Flewelling is an engineer with lots of, of, you know, uh, appreciation for what the exploration teams can bring and and you know when it comes to discovery so uh we were given a mandate to start to look at the gold and and kind of mid 2017 we hired an independent consultant 
a very well regarded structural geologist to look at the data in the ring of fire and give us an honest opinion. Are we barking up a tree here or, or you know, are we seeing potential that's untapped? And his view was absolutely the latter. There's excellent potential for gold mineralization up there. You know, it's a challenging area to work, but where there's challenges, there's opportunities. And, and the opportunity was the staking, you know, like when in 2013 and 2014, a lot of ground came open. And uh, so we, we seized the opportunity there and, and staked it. And yeah, well, and, and, and also opportunistically taking care, uh, taking uh, advantage of the market downturn and, and yeah. uh, gobbling up the uh, basically uh, competitors' ground. And it's funny the discovery stories really remind me of what's happening in, in the belt that we're operating in uh, with Wabich. You know, the the Dietrich Fenelon mm -hmm. gold. It's the same same thing that you know people are looking for uh, VMS deposits in the past. They yeah. they stum they stumbled on gold. Uh, other companies looking, looking, looking for gold discover nickel. Yeah, it discovered nickel exactly. So it, it seems to be a pretty common theme here. And yeah, I mean obviously the sulfide deposits will be the first ones to be discovered here in the chrome mine. Right. Yeah, there will be lots lots of others to come. And I mean we yeah we can already see that from the VMS and and gold. Uh, deposits and showings that you've got and so in terms of going ahead with that like are, are you planning to be sort of a standalone uh, explorer up there or, or are you uh, interested in attracting JV partners I think you mentioned for gold you you were definitely looking for yeah for yeah for sure and, and part of the reasoning there is you know juniors that are both base metal and gold Sometimes the market has a hard time valuing that. Right? Tell me and, about it. <laughs> you know, so the thinking was we're probably not going to get a lot of um, appreciation for the gold results that we find. So maybe we find a partner that'll help us move that along, maybe mm -hmm. spin it out. You know, there's any any number of options there. Um, the the region is still challenged with infrastructure. That's less of an issue on the gold side for a couple of reasons. One, it, these are early stage targets. So, you know, a discovery, if, you, if, you, if you're realistic, you're, you're sort of looking at a three to five year minimum discovery timeline. You're mm -hmm. going to have to do that early stage work. You're going to have to get out there and do the soil sampling. You're going to have to test targets systematically and move them along in order to be able to find a deposit. So you have, you've got that buffer. But then on top of that, you know, if you find a significant gold deposit, you can run that remotely. Yeah. You don't necessarily need a road. You know, if there was a 10 million ounce gold deposit discovered in the ring of fire, and I'm just throwing that out there because that sounds like a nice number, uh, that, that, you know, at the right grade would almost certainly uh, support its own, um, you know, operations. With oh, exactly. And then you don't need the ferrochrome smelter and you don't need a, yeah, so so that's a right. compl com complicated processing. Yeah. Uh, procedures for it so yeah it's, it's easier to develop it making sure that there's buy-in substantial buy-in participation from the communities is is absolutely critical and and so that's our vision our vision is that we're moving forward as as partners with the communities and that they are as excited about um, mining and exploration as we are now yeah you know it's uh i think that's hopefully a vision that gets shared more and more in the mining industry. I think, I think it's happening, but it's, it'll take some time. The advantage we have Attila in this industry is that we work with uh, a lot more first nation people than, um, you know, your average non-indigenous person, right? Because we're going into remote areas, because we, 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 we were, you know, we're working in areas that are the traditional territory of, of a lot of these community members. So, um, I think a lot of times mining communities or sorry, rather mining companies and exploration companies, the good ones have a better view, uh, an understanding of what first nation communities are looking for than, yeah. and, and industries or, or individuals that don't have those conversations routinely. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I guess we still have that. The mining industry still has a pretty bad reputation and, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, in, in fact, the mining industry is actually doing much, much more consultation and much better job at listening to, to the local communities than, than a lot of the other industries. We're just uh, maybe not as good as uh, not, not as good at um, um, 
you know, really telling the story or telling our side. I of think the story. you're right. I think absolutely that's it. I think that we struggle with trying to promote. And um, that kind of brings me to another question that that uh, Ed had is is um, you know how much so so the the, the uh, decision to um, advance Eagles Nest first and and look at the development of Eagles Nest ahead of the chromite deposits. Uh, and, and, and not even including in the PFS, the chromite deposits. Is that, what's the main reason for that? Is that just the, because it requires a ferrochrome smelter because the market is, is like you said, a bit more challenging or, or? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, uh, 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 to build a smelter, the timeline to build it, the cost to build it is not gonna be insignificant. Um, it'll be a lot less capital intensive to build a, a nickel copper PGE yeah. mine, yeah. you you're selling concentrate, and and the quality of that concentrate is very good. So you know it's very marketable. Should mm-hmm. not be a problem um, um, paying down your capital fairly quickly. So yeah. that's our view: is to start with Eagle's Nest. It's it's easy easier to build, easier to permit, um, and easier to make your money back, and then use that to open the door, if you will, to the ring of fire, and then let the chromite uh, business unit play out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. Now, why those uh, investments? So you didn't talk about it too much, but yeah, I guess in December, uh, you welcomed Wilo as, as one of your biggest. Uh, they are our largest yeah. shareholder yeah. now. Yeah. So, is what is that going to mean in terms of, of expiration for you? Like, is is there going to be uh, a different, you know, a shift or more structure in, in the in the commodity focus of what you know. Do they have a mandate of what you should be focusing on? Or, um, I mean, or, it's still early days. We're getting to know them. They're getting to know us. But early early uh, feedback has has been that they would love to see another nickel discovery. Um, you know, and uh, they're very supportive of our exploration approach. Uh, but they certainly wouldn't be disappointed with a gold discovery. Or something, you know, significant in the copper zinc space. So um, I think it's, you know, from what we've heard, that they're 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 supportive. They appreciate the exploration prospectivity up there. Uh, mm-hmm. We're still trying to figure out budgets and and financing and whatnot. But I expect twenty. So twenty twenty one, you know, on top of everything else, you've got COVID and whatnot. But so twenty twenty one will be uh, a little bit of a, you know, getting to know our new partners, them getting to know us. Yeah, we are doing a little bit of a, a of a reset on our nickel expiration, coming back to it from the copper zinc space. So we've got some work we have to do in house on that, and but we want to hit the ground running kind of mid year and into the third quarter. Um, so that that's our plan right now, and I think that's a viable plan. Mm-hmm. So while uh, you know, are they going to provide some technical expertise, like technical partnership as well, or is it more? You know, just yeah, I imagine. I imagine we'll well, like, th- look, they're going to have two board seats. Um, we're already in conversations with their technical guys, and um, so, I mean, we're we know the Ring of Fire very, very well, but they know nickel, right? So, okay, uh, yeah. it'll be a nice, a nice sort of marriage of of technical skills and and, and vetting targets and and that sort of thing. But uh, I don't expect that they'll be overly um, um, sort of micromanaging things, but certainly we'll we'll seek their input, and and I'm sure we'll get it. Uh, They're interested in other battery metals as well. Right? They are. So they might have a bigger push on on palladium exploration then, or you yeah. mentioned all these reefs that I, I found interesting. Obviously, those are also a little bit more challenging to explore for. But oh uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, they're like gold in the sense that maybe a little bit easier because you know when you're looking for PGs in the Ring of Fire. My, my advice is look for nickel because yeah. you find nickel, you'll find PGs, but there are environments where you could have low sulfide reefs and, and you, uh, yeah, you got to assay for it. And, you have to assay, you have to drill. And uh, so um, yeah. there are targets there, but the, you know, the, 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 this, this is the thing with the ring of fire is that the prospectivity is there. Uh, some of these deposits and target types won't probably be fully tested until Eagle's Nest is, is, is in development or in operation mm-hmm. and, and the budgets are there to support sustained um, wide sort of widespread exploration because right now we're sort of doing little piecemeal approaches. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the and the rail. So there's a rail line proposed as well, right? By KWG. Um, yeah, there is. Yep. And is is that in any in any way still relevant to your project or? or no. 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 Okay. It's not because we don't see it as necessary for the volume of material that we would want to move out of the Ring mm -hmm. of Fire. Certainly not for the first ten years. Yeah. Probably twenty. I mean, down the road, perhaps, but um, yeah, to start, no, absolutely there, yeah. not. And and the other problem with the rail is is it doesn't benefit the communities. I mean, these roads have to go in to benefit the communities. That's that's how they're going in as community roads first, and then an industrial road. So the railroad, uh, from our view, this it's not necessary not to start. Now, some some people brought up geophysics, and um, trying to, to see, there's a couple. And so, what kind of geophysics, you know, tools are useful for for, for, for your deposits, or you know, how deep can they see? Is is, is I guess. Uh, well, I mean, typical nickel sulfide mineralization. It's often pyrite rich, which makes it quite conductive. So um that's great for em um, targeting um, so start with the airborne em surveys and then surface ground em surveys and then when you're into uh, an area where you're drilling we absolutely follow up with borehole geophysics because yeah. it's so important as you know working in the Sudbury Basin, you could be 50 meters away from an ore body. If you don't do the borehole geophysics, you could miss it. And yeah. uh, we've had experience with that in the McFolds Basin. Um, and so uh, same holds true, even more so with nickel. Um, some of the other, you know, gravity work very, very well for the chromite deposits. Uh, they're so dense, so much more dense than the surrounding host rocks. Um, so airborne gravity, ground gravity, um, once, once the chromite discoveries were made and the gra ground gravity surveys were done, I think it was like shooting fish in, in a barrel mm -hmm. in terms of, of success rate. Um, <clears throat> certain things like ZTEM, that, that's interesting to me, yeah. um, MT, because I think, you know, we're moving away from that shallow hundred, couple hundred meters down into the the depths and, and we want to see you know there's big resistivity contrast between say the ultramafic rocks and the granodiorite rocks so knowing where uh, how deep those ultramafics go are there areas that are less resistive within the ultramafics than others that may indicate the presence of sulfides you know um, do we have deep mag and or gravity anomalies that are unexplained with anything from surface, yes. <laughs> so, you know, drilling a few deep platform holes and, and doing some uh, borehole geophysics and, or I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, but we throw everything at, we can at it until it's it's an area that is, is, is ripe for geophysics. Virtually all of the uh, yeah. base metal discoveries were, were, were geophysically driven. So yeah, geophysics yeah. is, is features very, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know exploring for gold i often wish there was something like a borehole you know, i know that we could, <laughs> that we could that we could i mean uh, the best you can hope for is is uh, if it's you know you got sulfides chargeable or it's highly resistive maybe you can throw some ip at it yeah so <laughs> somebody's uh uh michael's asking here uh, if you can compare your grades to canada nickels uh, grades i guess we don't want to uh promote other companies too much but um so their you know their high grade stuff is is seems to be below your cutoff grades yeah and I it's a totally different doing. totally different deposit yeah. style uh open pit versus underground they have road access power the location is still different yeah exactly. yeah yeah it's very you know totally but you also mentioned that the pfs was run still with with uh, much lower prices right so uh, you said there's yeah. some optimization that you could maybe you can probably do with yeah the absolutely like look at the palladium pricing i think for our our repeasibility study i think we we used uh 345 dollars an ounce palladium and so compare that to now and i mean whether palladium yeah. stays where it is but i i don't see it going racing back down to 700 dollars. i think the long-term forecast for palladium is actually still quite rosy and um so 
that's good. That's good for Sudbury. That's good for Lactazil. That's good for Noron. That's good for anybody in, who's who's got byproduct palladium. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, let's hope it stays that way. Yeah. Um, the the lower quality stainless steel that has no nickel would be like your fridge door uh, or your toaster, and that's not going away. So demand for ferrochrome will continue to exist. Um, where will it be met? We hope that uh, that 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 um, Noront and and Ontario can meet that demand with a much cleaner, yeah. greener well, exactly. yeah. product. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Exactly. Like, let, you know, let's do it here in Canada where we can do it sustainably and, and yeah. clean and uh, you know environmentally yeah. friendly. Yeah. And um, yeah, so kind of finishing off, uh, I guess if you can put on your um, rose-colored glasses. So, I, what do you envision? Ring of fire, say ten years from now. So ten years from now, <clears throat> I would like to say uh, we would that Eagle's Nest would be well into production at that point. Um, you know, we'll have the road to the Ring of Fire to Martin Falls and to Webaquay. Um, not just roads to those communities and any of the other communities that want it, but hopefully um, um, improved IT you know, internet, uh, infrastructure, electrical, possibly 10 years might be a bit early, but, uh, eventually, um, power to those communities, grid power. Um, we would hope that Blackbird would be on the development path at that point. Um, you know, with, with close to, to completed feasibility study, um, and lots of exploration in the region for additional, uh, resources and, or, uh, I'm really putting the rose color glasses, but you know, <laughs> defining the next uh, dr- drilling off the next big nickel deposit that will extend the mine life at Eagle's Nest another 10 to 20 years, you know. So, yeah, well, so uh, be it. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm sure, uh, yeah, once it's developed, yeah, I mean, people got to be patient. I mean, obviously, when you, uh, yeah, I mean, most people know that finding a deposit, even in a, in a, in a less remote place and in a more, uh, uh, you know, in a place with more infrastructure, it still requires 10, 15 years, usually an average to get, get it developed. Moving, we're moving into the next generation here. We, we already have uh, of mines and we're looking at electrification. You know, we're looking at the social license to operate. Um, we're looking at, you know, the benefits that have to spin out, um, employing more, more uh, women and minorities. And you see it more and more. And I think that's great. And uh, so the ring of fire will, I think it'll set a little bit of a standard um, yeah. that way, right? With the First Nation-led road proponencies, you know, the benefits that will, will come out of this. Um, so I'm excited yeah. about it. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's an exciting area to work in geologically, but it's also very exciting just to see, uh, the, the, you know, to see the opportunities that exist for some of these communities and the members. Like, you know, we run about 60, when we're operating in, at ESCA, we're about 60% of our workforce is First Nations. And that's why yeah. design, you know, that's that's not by chance. We, we make a conscious effort to hire from the local communities because we know we need their support. And uh, we want them to see the kind of player that Noron is. We want them to uh, understand the mining cycle at the early exploration stage. And we've had resounding success. You know, people uh, rarely want to leave. And, and if they do, they want to come back. So, um, yeah, hope to continue that trend and, and expand it. Yeah, well, good luck. Yeah, for sure. Um, good. Well, we don't have more questions coming in. But, uh, yeah, it's, there was a lot of interest. Obviously, it's a, it's a very exciting Belt, very exciting project, and everybody is is looking forward to uh, to to seeing seeing you guys being successful up there. And yeah, like like we just said, uh, hopefully lead by example of how we can sustainably b- develop a new b- belt in the in the twenty first century instead of uh, cleaning up afterwards like we're that's doing right. in a lot of places like yeah, Sudbury right. and Ruan. And, and there'll be no there. legacy uh, issues in the Ring of Fire. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ryan, for uh, taking the time and answering all these questions. And uh, thanks for the audience, uh, uh, for the interest. Obviously, well, thank uh, you. We yeah, really, really and, appreciate uh, the opportunity here. All the best with, uh, yeah, hopefully with Wilo, you have a you have an investor that's sort of a long-term 
uh, it has a long-term vision and they can support you uh, sort of uh, moving this ahead. And uh, yeah, and you can have an active uh, expiration season uh, later this year. Hopefully uh, with COVID, we can still, still uh, uh, manage, right? Yeah, we can. We did. Uh, last August, we managed uh, to run it about six weeks, no, seven, eight weeks in, uh, up in the ring of fire. So, you know, again, I think there's another example where the mining industry is doing pretty good. Um, obviously, not all expiration camps and mines have, have been as successful, but um, by and large, it's been pretty good. So yeah. um, I think uh, we adapt, we're adapting and and hopefully the vaccinations pick up, but in the meantime, we'll continue to do all the protocols and make sure that uh, people are working safely and, and, uh, and, you know, making sure that goes, everyone goes home safe. Yeah, we'll get through this. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks everybody else. Uh, if we thanks, can, uh, if you can all uh, try to unmute yourself, we can give uh, Ryan a big, big round of applause. Maybe. <laughs> I see I see the clapping the clapping icon so <laughs> thanks so much everybody really appreciate your time and your attention and uh, if you have any other questions uh, you can always find me on LinkedIn I'm always happy to talk about the ring of fire and, and appreciate this opportunity Attila thanks a lot yeah all right thanks a lot take care good night everyone thank you bye <laughs> bye